Hello and welcome to our Oscars edition podcast. This is a co-production of the Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection. And we're speaking with the nominees in the sound categories. And I am especially excited to bring you uh, a really wonderful conversation, two conversations actually, about the film Roma. Uh, the first part one of this episode is a conversation that I was able to have with the director Alfonso Coron and members of the sound team uh, at Raleigh Studios uh, a couple of months ago about their work on the film. And then in part two of the podcast, uh, it's a deep dive conversation with the uh, supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer Skip Livesay about his work on the film. So enjoy this two-part episode on the sound of Roma. So if I can be permitted to just uh, be a fanboy for a second, um, Alfonso, my gosh. Um, so before I joined Dolby to create the Dolby Institute, I ran Skywalker Sound for 11 years. So I've heard a few tracks uh, over the course of the years. But I uh, am really not exaggerating when I say that the, the work that you and the team did on Roma is the most complex, detailed, rich sound mix I've ever heard. So congratulations to everyone on the team. Thank you. It's really an extraordinary achievement. Uh, Alfonso, I wanted to start with you with sort of a kind of a, an aesthetic, creative question. Um, I'm, I'm, I've been around in the business long enough to have been taught as a baby sound person never to pan the dialogue off of the screen. So, uh, and you know, you have been really bold in your imaginative use of dialogue in the 3D space on this film. And it, uh, you know, you started, uh, I started noticing that in Gravity and you've really taken that approach uh, Right, exactly. So can you talk a little bit about um, was, you know, moving the dialogue around and being in that space part of your design of the film from the beginning? Um, and what, what effect does that have on the audience? Yeah, uh, I guess that everything started uh, when we were in London, we were working on, on, on gravity, and we were invited by Dolby to check this new system, this Atmos system. And we went to the Dolby Theater in, in London and they showed this clip that was fantastic because it was just dark and only sounds. And the sound was a rainfall in some kind of jungle over a tin roof. You remember? And it was so, I was in awe about it. And I remember we were there and I said, you know what? This is the future, but not only that. This system lends itself more than big action films is for th stuff that is more intimate. And, uh, and then we went to do, use, uh, in Gravity, we did, uh, we did, uh, uh, we used, we did Atmos. Um, but when I started to think, even as a director, as a writer, thinking about this, it was already thought out as an Atmos film. And the, in the script, it's very well described all the sound, the sound scope of the whole thing. Uh, I believe, and I don't want to attack, is that usually Atmos has been so badly used in cinema. Um, it's been used for not, loudness. Not, not by any of these guys, obviously. No, of course then. No. <laughs> no, it's just that it's been used for loudness. And yes, Atmos can be absolutely loud. And, uh, but the amazing thing of Atmos is the subtlety. It's about... It's not so much about, uh, about loudness, it's about spread. Spread and creating a three-dimensional quality in your, in, in, your, in, your, in your screening room. And we wanted to do that. It was to honor the camera was this ghost from the present, visiting in the past, in a kind of removed way, but immersed in the reality of, uh, of the situation. And, we talk, when we talked from the beginning with Jose Antonio and with Craig and, and, and Skip, we, we knew from the get-go that it was going to be Atmos. It, it had to be. We had to have a, a path to extend the image into the sound. We wanted that bridge from what we had visually to extend into the audio. And we wanted the characters to be as clear and interesting and detailed in the soundtrack as they were in the image itself. We just wanted to be in the same room as the beautiful images, basically. <laughs> well, you've also, the, the film is told, um, you, you, you use a lot of long takes um, and a lot of, you know, uh, if not 360, nearly 360 pans. And that is a really 
perfect approach to be able to use that technology to, to seamlessly move the sound around the audience. Yeah, but even they, in the days back to Ito Mama Tambien, uh, it was this thing of, if we have cuts, I kept on saying, I want to hear the cuts because I'm in a different point of view. I want to hear the difference of, instead of doing, you know, the wild track that is going to kind of smooth all the cuts, it's not, to feel the cuts. So you're in a new place, in a new point of view. And yeah, I'm pretty much, Atmos is a continuation of, of that stuff. It's a question because like, traditionally the music is static, it stays, it doesn't move, it doesn't respond to anything in the image, basically. I mean, of course, if there's you know, a, an action scene, the music is responding to that, but it doesn't move. So as a, as a sound person, as a mixer and a sound editor, you have this question, are we presenting like the way the music presents, or are we part of the image the way the dialogue and other things have to be? And you have that edge. Which side of the edge are we going to be on? The, the sort of cinema side, the kind of traditional side, or something more? Uh, with possibility of being more interesting, so. Yeah, after, after Gravity, uh, a, 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 a mixer come to me, came to me and said, I don't like that stuff. He says, I find it very distracting. Oh, moving the dialogue around Moving so the dialogue and the music, and, and particularly the, the dialogue is the thing that bothered him the most. He said, I keep on turning around. And I said, look, I trust contemporary audiences. And I... And, not me to offend you, but I think that the people who are looking around, I understand that the first time you look around and then you get it. And I don't think, I think it's, pro, it's, it's possible that here and there you, you turn and you get it, you know? But the, the person who keeps on looking around is the same person that at the end of the film goes to where the screen is and looks underneath to look for the actors. <laughs> you know? <it's, laughs> That's a, that's a great put down. That's, a, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, well, Skip, you kind of t uh, teed up a, another question I have, which is, uh, you know, you've made a, an, a beautiful drama uh, without the use of a traditional film score. So there's a lot of music in the film, but not a traditional score. Lynn, Lynn is, is grabbing her microphone. I think she's, she's got something she wants to say about this too. But I, I'm curious, was that always part of the design for you for this film, that you, were, that, that you would use, I guess, diegetic music from the, from the period and the era? Or was that something that you that explored and found? It was a decision from the, since the inception of the film, and that the sound, the music was going to be precisely that, what these guys were going to do, that the challenge began with Jose Antonio and the sound mix because he knew that this was going to be what we were going to do and we talk about. So his challenge was how to record groups of people keeping everything completely separate because characters would move around and on top of that, the backgrounds and the combination of well, he knows better than me about how he separated that on stage, you know, where we were shooting or in location. But also, after the takes, going and doing specific sounds with specific groups of people because he knew, okay, but he goes over there and I don't have enough spread, let's do a wild track or, or let's uh, do these extras in the background. Well, you, you know more than what, what you were doing there, Jose. Yes, um, I don't think I ever recorded so much information ever in my life. <laughs> and I've been doing this for like 40 years. It was about 450 gigs, to put it in uh, perspective, a regular movie takes around 130, 150. And this was almost 500 gigs, basically. So everything had to be, you know, mic'd. I mean, if, if I, we could, the dog was Mike sometimes. You know? <laughs> but basically, it was you know the, the the challenge of you know trying to be, have every single character, every every single atmosphere, and every single uh, sound that was prevailing in the scene isolated because we knew we were gonna have to be moving them. So that was basically 
a good challenge. Yeah, I wondered if you could just talk to us. Um, uh, one of the sequences that, that uh, popped out in my, my mind was the, the sequence in the furniture store, uh, and then the, as the student riot kind of uh, starts to happen. Yeah. Can you just talk, uh, talk a little bit about your process of, of recording the production tracks for that scene? Well, that was a combination of, you know, several mics all over the place, combined with uh, wild tracks and combined uh, with additional sound people being around the crowd. That was a very intense, um, you know, mic scene. And then, you know, obviously the wild tracks at the end of the singing, uh, which came out beautiful, I think. And... Um, Basically, it was that, you know, hiding mics all over the place. And, um. Yeah, you had mics, like, from the roof of the building when we were doing wild tracks of the crowd, mm -hmm. that we went from the building, and then some you were immersed inside, yeah. some you were in different, different, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. different perspectives. Yeah. But that day, precisely, we brought uh, an additional sound team to, to do mostly atmospheres and in the background and move it in. We move oh, yeah, them around. The, the, the extra, because also at home, in the house, what we would do is, Jose would see which need, sounds he needed on top of that, and there was a crew going in the middle of the night when it's completely, well, the most quiet you can get in Mexico City, to do specific footsteps and doors and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, because did I read this correctly? You rebuilt the house in, in uh, an existing location, right? So that was not on a soundstage. You, you weren't under a controlled circumstance. So you were dealing with Mexico City crowd, and like just all. The flight path of the airport <laughs> every five minutes. Like every five minutes. And would you hold for the plane or no, just keep going? Well, it would came to a, a point where, you know, I had to calculate more or less when it was fading away. So Two minutes we have, or three minutes. <laughs> and we had kind of like, uh, find out there's a scheduling and stuff. But, but First he wanted to hold the planes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody could do it, it would be Alfonso Coron, no? Yep. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, I did want to ask you, uh, Alfonso, I love the presence of the planes and how subtle it is, but uh, how present and pervasive it is. What, is from just, what, what did the planes mean to you as a child growing up there? Well, for one, I mean, if you just want to be realistic about a film in Mexico City, he just said it every five minutes at least you have the, uh, an airplane passing by. I mean, there are many other metaphorical things. My problem with about talking about the meaning of things is that I take away the meaning of the audience. You know, if I, I it's only I narrow the, the meaning to what I think is the meaning, well, I, I don't really know the meaning. I think that it's up to the audience to, to decide what the play means for them. Good. Um, Lynn, I did want to uh, just ask you about your process of, of finding this incredibly rich um, musical palette uh, for the film and how did you source the songs and, and uh, what was your process of, of working with Alfonso? I was trying to remember the same things he remembered. He's older than me, but we share the same world. So I tried to not fight to his memory and share the same memories that he had. So we went over long hours of choosing songs. And then as we really worked without a script, he has it, but we didn't. So it was mostly trying to called the things by the name he was calling them and remember them along the days and the weeks. So it was really nice for me because I actually remember a lot of the songs that used to play in my kitchen or in my, my house in the living room. So we divided the songs between what was heard in the house, in the father's living room, in the parents' living room, then what was heard in the kids' room and then in the kitchen. So that helped along when he was shooting to ask me for songs and send me more for the kitchen or send me more for the hacienda. So we divided among the rooms and the spaces and the, and the habitat of the house how he chose the songs. So from there I started to send songs and sometimes he forgot about them and chose some new. So we were changing the songs along. I think we're still changing the songs now as we're doing other projects, we're doing albums for the film, but, but still, uh, and that was a process, like trying to get along with his memories of things, because I also did the image, the stock image of the film. 
So whatever is on the movie, on the movie theaters and whatever is on the TV, we choose also that. So he opened up for me memories that I didn't remember. He insisted that there, there is a guy called Sobek, which is in the Torteria, and Sobek is, he used to be a magician. And I remember Sobek in another kind of show, in a film, and he insisted that he was in the Siempre en Domingo. So at the end I found that he was right, but I couldn't remember that. So it was nice because I started to remember my house, my family. So I share very emotional feelings through music because I grew up with those songs as well. Led Zeppelin and ACDC came later, but I grew up with those ones. So the process was that, like trying to get it in his mind and of course making a lot of notes because I knew he was gonna change later and say, no, no, I didn't like that song, send me more. So I keep sending. He's a, he's a insatiable an musical animal. He loves music, so, and his memories are full of that. So it was very, th that was like the process that I f follow with him. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at a clip. Um, one of the things that's remarkable to me about Roma is that once you kind of sit and you let the movie sort of start to wash over you, you, you stop being aware of all the unbelievably complex work that went into building the film. But this will give you kind of a little bit of a sense of what's going on uh, with the track. Um, I think, Craig, did we, did we wanted to watch Hail? Sure. Yeah. Um, Do you want to set this up? Uh, this is in the house and it's raining, hailing. Um, and what you guys were talking about earlier in terms of 360 and, and moving. So everything is sort of, all the atmospheres are sort of moving with the camera and a dialogue is sort of moving and um, the kids are playing outside so the camera comes around and all the hail comes around. But also in terms of not just the panning but in terms of level and like volume level and in terms of EQ, in terms of what you start hearing at any given time is sort of what this whole little sequence will sort of show. Now what we're gonna see, visually, you're gonna see what is called the Dolby uh, RMU. It's a Dolby Atmos RMU, which is basically a visual representation of all the panning. So you're gonna see a bunch of ye yellow dots or yellow balls, for instance, and you're gonna see them in what is essentially a theater, and you're gonna see them move around and all the panning that we had done when we were sort of mixing and we were looking on the, looking, we work, when we work in a theater, we work in a big theater like this with a big screen and a mixing console and we have panning joysticks and we can literally take one sound and pan it super discreetly all the way around the Atmos sound field. And Alfonso was in the middle of Skip and I and it was like, okay, this here and we're gonna follow this guy and then we back up and we grab another track and we do another track. So that's kind of what this, this clip will sort of represent that. Um, Adam was nice enough to superimpose the picture in the RMU so you can kind of get a side by side of what the visual is with the panning. So. And just super cursory by way of explanation, what we're talking about is um, the, the Dolby Atmos sound system, because you can target any speaker in the, in the 3D space, it gives you the, the ability to treat sound not in tracks in 5.1 or 7.1, but as individual specific objects. So you're gonna see what we call the, ball, the, the balls, the old balls, but each one of those balls is a, is, is a, uh, is a, uh, an, optic, uh, an audio object, so it's right. a specific sound that is being moved around in the 3D space of the, the 3D of the, space. So the yes, you're going to see you're going to see some balls on the bottom, and then you're going to see some in the middle, and then you're going to see some on the top, and all of them all of them represent um, sounds. And some of the rain is steady, some of the rain is moving, some of the hail is moving, and it basically just helps us in and sort of make an immersive experience. Um, so let's, let's run it, and you can kind of let's watch the hail see. clip. So that, but now seeing that, I'm sure he's going to say, hey, that one up there is wrong. You panned it the wrong way or something. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. Seek it again. <laughs> uh, Carlos, I wanted to ask you, um, as, as the, the post-production supervisor, uh, had you ever worked on anything this complex before? And, oh, and how did I you wrangle all this? Okay. I don't think... I've, I, I would never imagine the extents of the work that I was facing at the beginning. I, would, I thought at the beginning it would be just... A long shooting process, because we knew it would be long. We would never imagine the amount of days that it would actually take. It was complicated also because of the format that it was chosen to do the shoot on. But I would never imagine the amount. It, and it's been a very long ride, but it's been so uh, enlightening. I've, never, I've learned so much. I, 
This process made me start from the beginning. I've been working on, on feature films and Mexican, small Mexican films all my life, and I've never imagined how, how, how big it, this would become at the very end. No? Every process we've been involved took its own time. I've never, I've never worked on something that had the amount of time that it really needed to be worth. And of course, it, at, for me, it's been mostly a learning experience you know, from, the, from the beginning. But, uh, and this team, it's just the most amazing team I've ever imagined working. I, I've known Lynn, and that's the only one that I've worked with before. But other than that, it's just the most uh, strange ride. It's been like going uh, a step at a time, uh, learning as we go, because we were discovering what was needed for each of the, of the process. You know, we were just following Alfonso to lead us where he wanted to be, and we were trying to find uh, resources and tools to get there, as, as, as he was requesting. That, 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 that's the extent of of what we actually did. I was just a companion to all the wonderful work that all this team was doing. Can you tell the story about the corrupted sound files when you send it to? <laughs> well, the, we, of course, we, we've been uh, shooting for a long process and and just handling all this information because if of course there was a lot of of sound files uh, recorded but can you imagine the amount of image files as well so and this is a very very big format for for shooting process but and yeah well just handling all that information all that data all that throughout the more than 20 weeks of shoot was a huge task just Keeping everything in order and so on, so we can, and we, I think we managed ourselves well because the whole film was scanned at the end. No, so yeah, but I'm talking about when you send the file to Dolby to be conformed. Ah, after okay. The well, mix. that was a very strange thing that happened at the very end. When we were able to build the first TCP, we sent the render, the RMU render files to the lab to build the. The DCP. And when they saw the files, they came back at me saying that something was wrong because the files were too big. And that they were, they were not used to working with this and that something might probably be wrong. So and, we, and this was after they had done gravity and, and this was so big that it was, there was something they thought was something wrong with yeah, it. Yeah, they, they knew who we were talking about. So when, <laughs> but they said, no, this is something wrong. You, you're sending me the wrong thing because we've never worked with a, a, a file as big as this one. So we checked, we made sure that it was good, and we they finally realized that it was wrong. But we were like breaking records, <laughs> like all over the every process that we faced. It was a new like record. They will never, they they never used, did a, a, a DCP with a, a file, a sound file as, as big as this one. It's just immense, and and we kept facing those things. I I, I get used to. Answers like no, no, no. This this can't be done, or this. But this film, this film's just breaking all the records that we can find. It. Adam, I have a question for you. Um, as a picture editor, uh, one of the things I found extraordinary was um, uh, that Alfonso shot the film in sequence, so um, that uh, with very little variation, he actually sequentially went through. So my understanding was that as the picture editor, you didn't read the script before you started cutting the film. It wasn't that I didn't read the script, I wasn't given the script. So, I, I, I would have read it if I had it. Um, but, but, um, oh, Alfon none of you guys were given the script before. No. No, no, really? None. Alfonso, you <laughs> devil, you. I spurred him something. <laughs> well, can you talk about what, so what was that process like, cutting the movie without having any idea where things were going? It was um, very interesting just for watching everything for the first time. So not just ha like having clean eyes, having just a clean brain. I, I didn't know where it was going. I didn't know what was gonna be happening to the characters. So uh, what I found I needed to do early on when I was just watching dailies at home, just because we, we started cutting after post together, but I did an assembly just to learn the footage and get my own reactions to everything. 
I would find that I would start watching the shots, and then after a couple of takes, I'd need to start again, because I then knew what was going on, and I just wasn't analysing it as an editor, I was just watching it as a cinema goer, and I would just fall into the shots and go, oh, that's great, no, what, what, well, like, hang on a minute, I've got to take notes, and go through and just, and work through it, so, um, I really liked it. So when we sat down and started editing, I had a very unique viewpoint and opinion on what I had connected with, because I went in with no thoughts on what it was going to be, because I didn't know what it was going to be. And at the end, I kept watching, like, as the movie was coming to an end, I was just like, is this the last shot? No, okay. Is this, oh, is this the, we've got another scene, great, is this the last shot? So when it suddenly panned up, and we kind of end with that beautiful shot, looking up, it's like, ah, I get it, we're here now. This is, yeah, it's just come in, together. We, we shot in chronological order, so, Adam was assembling everything as he was learning what the movie was about. Yeah. Everyone here has seen it, right? Or no. Oh, okay, no spoilers. Um, okay. And back Carol. then he didn't speak Spanish. Now he speaks Spanish, but back then at the beginning he didn't speak Spanish. He understands the cursing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you were, what, you, were, you were seeing dailies come in, and you did, obviously it wasn't subtitled when you were watching dailies, but you don't speak Spanish? Um, I had a fantastic assistant that was putting markers on and translating it for me, because I didn't have a script, so I had no heads up. Um, I tried learning Spanish very early on, but then I got into this part where I was trying to translate in my head, and I couldn't keep up. I wasn't watching it as an editor. I wasn't analyzing the footage, so I realized I had to... Just and just to make things more complicated for Adam is that no, no take is the same. Can you explain that? Yeah, um, as an example from that, that hail scene, which is a four minute take, um, Alfonso did 60 takes. So I've got four hours of footage just for that one shot. 60 takes, and my understanding was that you shot that scene for three days? <laughs> Ish? <laughs> uh, one day, three days. Wow. But Alfonso would keep giving direction to the kids to kind of change things up. So it wasn't it, like a standard setup where it's 60 versions of the same thing, same reading. There was so much variation in it that it, it was just such an important decision when we sat down to kind of make the selects of where we would go because that would affect ultimately the next scenes and, and following it on. It's an amazing high wire routine you're pulling because you don't have coverage. <laughs> like you don't, where, where, if something doesn't work, where do you go? <laughs> Lucky for all of us it works so well. Uh, yeah. Thanks again to the panelists. This was a really, uh, it was a great discussion, and thank you, Alfonso. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So that was part one of our conversation on The Sound of Roma with Alfonso Caron, the writer, director of the film, and the sound team. In part two, we're going to focus uh, on uh, the work of Skip Livesey, who is the supervising sound editor and the re-recording mixer. Enjoy it. My name is Glenn Kaiser. Again, I'm the director of the Dolby Institute. Uh, and this uh, conversation is uh, kind of a collaboration between the Dolby Institute and the New York Film Festival Artist Academy. Um, we're really thrilled to have all of you here. Uh, and having just seen the movie Roma, uh, I'm thrilled to uh, introduce to you um, uh, my friend Skip Livesey, who is the sound supervisor and uh, mixer of Roma. Hello. Uh, Skip, I'm not going I, I, to embarrass him by uh, doing an exhaustive, hey. uh, an exhaustive review of, of his credits, um, but he has worked for Alfonso in the past on, uh, uh, on, a, on a Children of Men and a little movie called Gravity. Uh, he to Mama Tambien. Oh, he to Mama Tambien, sorry. And a little movie called Gravity for which he won the Academy Award for Best Sound. Uh, <laughs> and as I... <laughs> I should have brought that. As, um, as I mentioned before, uh, Skip is also incredibly well known uh, for being the sound uh, designer and supervisor and mixer uh, for the Coen brothers. Uh, you guys actually started together on Blood Simple, which was their first movie and your first movie, as I recall-ish. Uh, and then you've had perfect attendance ever since, working on every Coen brothers film. Buster Scruggs is film number 18. Yeah, so that's a pretty, pretty amazing, remarkable run. So, um, Roma, um, the, I, the first question I have for you in terms of sound design and mix is, this is what a two hour, 20 minute film with no musical score. Um, there's plenty, there's a lot of music in it, but it's, you know, to use the fancy term diegetic, so it's music that's naturally occurring in the environment from radios or bands or street things that are happening, that sort of thing, but no musical score. So. I have a couple of questions about that. First of all, was that part of Alfonso's vision from the beginning of the movie that there wouldn't be a score? 
or uh, and, and how does that affect your work as the sound designer? Uh, I think um, he had decided from the get-go that there would be no music uh, beyond the simple uh, coincidental music that happened you know in, in location, let's say. And I think that was part of his um, a lot of the movie, as you probably know, is based on his own life and it, it's it's a memory it's a movie about his memories of his childhood of these two years and the one thing that he had to do was get rid of and remove the pop music that was in his head at that time and and to, in that sense it's not totally accurate in the soundscape of his 1970 1971 period but um he, he thought that would be way too much of a distraction. And of course, I think he's right. I wouldn't disagree with him anyway, even if I didn't think he was right. <laughs> but uh, he, he thought that was an unnecessary distraction. And he thought it was much, um, in the way that everything was uh, meant to look accurate, he wanted it to sound accurate as well. And I think that was a, a crucial uh, hand of, of filmmaker uh, decision. That, that I think is um, what it does, as everyone knows, is that frees every the, the other parts, the other two main parts of the soundtrack is then freed to be uh, much more sincere and um, specific. And it makes the audience understand the situation um, in terms of another system because we know that uh, music in films and in opera, for instance, operates in a different level of your consciousness and your awareness than does dialogue or sound effects, particularly uh, sound effects which are in sync with the picture, not superimposed sound, uh, sound effects. So it, it, lets, it allows the audience to, um, we think, I would say we being me and Alfonso, uh, access the film in a different, slightly different path than if they were being, if you are being uh, guided by uh, cinema music. You've had some experience in, with this in the past. I know, you know, there's almost no music in No Country for Old Men. I actually erroneously thought there was none until Carter Burwell oh, corrected me in that wow. conversation. There's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's very subtle, but it is, it, it is in there. And it does do something, I mean, look, I'm, I'm certainly not espousing that people shouldn't use music, but it's, it's, it's a very specific kind of emotional tool. And how does it change the dynamic for you as the sound designer if that is not going to be there? Are you thinking about tones? Uh, then, then some of the emotionality transfers onto your shoulders. I would, hate, I would hesitate to take credit for that. I think uh, it's more about the audiences um, not being directed by the filmmaker in a, in a certain direction, and less about you, what, let's what we're doing. We'll, we'll share Will that. There'll be one. a difference. There we go. It's more about um, not being guided, and and your freedom to to enter the um, what's going on here and beyond um, more kind of freely and and um, more uh, objectively, I would say, without being taken and pulled into it by, because music, music, in the cinema experience, music, we think, ha, there are certain things about it that are, that you can't really divorce. And that is, uh, music works like um, smell. Uh, it goes to a different place in your brain than talking does. And when, and then on top of that, in the movies we have Basically, the, the music is almost always presented, not gravity, but pretty much everyone else, it's presented up here. So the music stays here. It always sounds generally the same, except for like songs. But the cinema music is presented up here. And it stays up here, no matter what's happening on the screen. Like, you know, if there's a car chase and things are going like wow and cutting back and forth, the music just stays here. It stays rooted there. and that's a kind of a trick that helps the audience actually get more out of what's happening on screen, we think, because they're being anchored by this reminder of what's happening now and blam, something happened, reinforce that or get really quiet, oh, oh, something's gonna happen. And I think um, 
like in No Country, for instance, not having music and not helping the audience to know where we're going to go next was a gigantic um, boost to the suspense of the film. You really did not know what was going to happen next. And you were never like given a um, hall pass to think, oh, okay, well, this is going to happen now. Get ready, because here it comes. And, and I think not having music allows you to not access that experience, that sort of more typical cinema experience. And it allows the audience to have a somewhat different and, and approach the music, the movie, in a, in a subtly different way. Did that do it? No, that was great. Um, you, you mentioned um, kind of being rooted to the screen and, and having the, those front screen channels doing the bulk of the work. And I definitely wanted to ask you about kind of the sense of, uh, you, I, I think you guys started this kind of experimentation with gravity and, and Roma takes it even further. Um, I, I have never experienced a movie that had so much dialogue coming from all around me, not just from the, from the screen channels. And certainly, you know, uh, you know I've, I've been in the business long enough to, to remember being taught never to, never to take, you know, never put dialogue in the surrounds. Uh, never take a dialogue off the screen. So obviously that rule w has been made to be broken and you guys have pretty much shattered it. Uh, and it has a really interesting effect on the audience. I'm curious, uh, again, was that always part of Alfonso's design? Was that something that you guys played with during the mix and arrived at that? Or what was the sort of thinking behind uh, that, that sort of really powerful um, use of, of the entire acoustic space? Um, I think... Um I, I, again, I wouldn't really claim the design uh, ownership of that idea. It was, it was something that Alfonso had created for us to work with, and we were uh, totally um, uh, commanded to work in that way. And uh, I think what he, he, of course, could tell you better, but I, I think probably what we were trying to go for was um, a, uh, a feeling of being a, um, an observer. It really is like an observational documentary. It really is like you don't see what's on that side of the camera. You only see what the camera is looking at. You're getting a voyeuristic point of view of, of the action. Um, but, it, but in a lovely way, the, the, um, the image is, is kind of locked off. Generally, it's, there's some slow pans and there's some, some scenes where there's shot and reaction, action, reaction shots. But... In general, the way they shot the movie was that um, so you could really get rooted in the scene and allow the scene to, to evolve around you. And um, the access for that was to make the audio shift with the picture. So no matter what the camera was doing, the audio had to stay locked in the space. So if the camera was slowly panning over here, that meant that all of everything had to slowly move this way, the opposite direction. So like if there was a refrigerator in the shot on this side, and as the camera panned, the camera pans away from the fridge and the, the sound of the fridge has to go and stay rooted on the fridge. The idea was, I think, that if we have this kind of fundamental um, anchoring of the concrete sounds in the environment that the audience could actually move beyond this proscenium and go into the frame. Uh, I think that's probably the goal of pretty much everyone in cinema, but this was a, an experiment, I would say, can this help that um, desire and that goal? Is this a, a path to let it, allowing the audience to actually step into the frame? And of course, music being non-moving, traditional except gravity, um, the movie stays here. That that fights that, and that creates another reason why we don't want to have cinema music in the film. Internal logic. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about? Uh, sure. As, as Andre Konjalovsky used to say to my wife, who's an editor, as it always was. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about the process of working with Alfonso? When, at what point do you get involved? What are the conversations that you have? Um, you know, are there, te are there temp mixes? 
just and how how involved is Alfonso on the mixing stage? That just sort of the way you guys work together. Um, it's um, it's kind of like an army situation where there's a general and a bunch of soldiers, basically. I mean, a lot of his movies, maybe all of his movies, have like a really, really, really uh, extremely um, well articulated point of view. And a lot of what we're doing is trying to fulfill the, uh, you're just trying to, like we used to say, we're just, I'm just trying to stay in the same room with this amazing image. I just want to be there and supporting that as, as best as I can. And um, I think um, one thing about this film, my co-mixer uh, Craig Hennigan and I, and and Sergio Garcia, the supervising sound editor, we just tried to be supportive and and um, get the things that he would allow because it, it's about his own childhood, and we we didn't really want to ask him, you know, did that really happen? What 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 were you thinking when that happened? You know. We let the um, talk shows deal with that, but the the you knew that it was there was a lot of really deeply felt stuff happening on screen, and my own childhood is is similar to this, and I was um, couldn't help but being drawn into um, some really deep feelings of my own. So we had to get break through the idea of making a film. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell, yeah, right? You talk for a minute. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I had the same reaction when I saw the film at Telluride. I think I told you when I was outside, I just, especially during that childbirth sequence, I just started to ugly crying, and I was not the only one in the audience, that's for sure. Um, I, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about... Um, what you had to work with uh, and the, the production tracks. I know, uh, I heard Alfonso talking about this at a Q&A at Telluride, and I know that there was a lot of improvisation, well, I don't want to say improvisation, but he, he surprised the actors a lot by withholding information mm. from them, giving it to them right before he shot. Um, and he shot the film sequentially, which I was really pretty stunned to find out. Uh, and that was definitely part no of the- script. Yeah, that was definitely part of the emotional kind of journey that, that he took the actors on because I don't know if you guys know this, but almost all the actors are non-professional in the film, um, uh, with the exception, I think, of the mother. The mother and one other person. Yeah, uh, all the kids were non-professionals. Um, so uh, what, <laughs> I, I hear that and I think, what kind of chaos in terms of production tracks came to you and, <laughs> and, and how did you go about kind of building this this world, which is obviously very important for him, that it be very realistic from an image standpoint, and, and the responsibility was on you to do the same thing with the sound. Yeah, we basically had, um, everyone was mic'd up, and in every scene, we, we almost had, uh, I would say in every scene, we had uh, lavalier mics like this one on every actor, and as well as boom mics and plant mics, and we spent a lot of time trying to sort and get the those things are never in sync, so they have to be, they're very subtly out of sync and they, to, in order to use both, which is what you almost always were trying to do because the boom mics and the plant mics sound much more natural, but they oftentimes are too noisy or, or really severely off mic, so it sounds too reverberant and weird. But if you can use them both together, the, the lavalier very direct sound and the, and the wider boom sound, you can create a nice uh, natural sound by having that. I mean, we basically had really good track for almost every line in the film. And um, I, I guess that's because they did a lot of takes. <laughs> Without, I don't know, honestly, um, how much time they spent on each scene, but I suspect it was, there was 20 or 30 takes of every You were telling shot. a story about the hail scene. Yeah. Okay, and the hell scene, uh, which is a 360, and the kids are in the courtyard and they're collecting and singing. And it's a 360, it's um, th three and a half minutes long. I mean, it's a very long shot. And in that, all this stuff is happening with the kids and the parents, and the mom is sitting with um, her mom, and the kids eventually come in and they all come running in, and now they're sitting together. And uh, the, mo the grandmother gets up, and 
Cleo comes in and, and sits down, and that's the scene where she tells the mom that she's pregnant. So um, I'm working on this sequence, and it's this one, the shot that's in the movie is like there's something about it. And, and um, at one point, this is what happened. At one point, the, the older boy stands up and grabs the paper and walks off uh, to the left. And um, I said to Alfonso, it's like, what, did something happen there? Because like the reaction, the kid's reaction to what was happening and the mom in particular was like, I just, it just sort of got my attention. <laughs> and Alfonso goes, I don't know how you figured that out. What the fuck? <laughs> Pardon my English, my French. Um, he said, well, that shot is take 68. So after three days of trying to get this sequence going, they, um, he said, I had to change it up. So I told the boy, I said, when you get to that point in the scene, take the paper, walk off the set, go over there, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. And like, I don't know what it is about the shot that got my attention that made me focus on that. But I said, look at the mother's reaction. It's so, it's so interesting. Like she's thinking, don't be mad at him because he's trying to, well, they, they were, the mom was trying to get the children to write the dad a letter saying, we miss you, please come home. And I don't know, it was something about that shot that just got my attention. Yeah. Yeah, you figured it out. <laughs> you, put, you put your finger right on it. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, but that's, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing that could happen only in a film like this. Maybe it's never happened before. They would shoot one sequence like that for several days. And on take 68, you would change it up. And I guess, you know, like we were talking about, maybe directors have this deck of cards of things they can do to, to like stir the pot. And a certain point, especially when things aren't working, especially on take 68. And maybe that's one of the like a, a director trick that you can do to get the actors to, to shake it up a little bit. And they're not actors, of course, so that makes it even more complicated. But yeah, what was your question? That was it. You answered it. <laughs> oh, it was basically about the, the production tracks and how they came in. Very and, good. I mean, yeah. We really had it. We, the movie, like like I say, a lot of the movie was was letting go and just doing what you were told, essentially, because Alfonso was so deeply focused, more than gravity, on the sound of their voices and the sounds that we were doing and making things make fit his reality of what things should sound like. And Craig and I just a lot of times we just couldn't tell. We didn't we did, we did our thing. And we said, well, that seems right. And then he would come in and go too loud, too loud, too bright, too loud. And we'd, so we'd change it and we'd mush it and we'd spend, we spent several days on each reel. And the final mix was 10 weeks, by the way. Did anyone tell you that? 10 Se weeks. Seven days a week, 12 hours a day for 10 weeks. Much more time than I've spent on any, <laughs> any other final mix. But um, it was just a very, very complicated movie and very, most of the, the background um, voices that you hear were, are, um, were done as group ADR. And they had one session, there were several sessions, but one session that I was involved in was in Mexico City. And there were 350 performers, and that was a five-day recording session. And that was for background people walking by. Like the scene in the, in the hospital in the lobby, all that talking, everything in there basically was a group ADR recording for a certain person sitting at a certain place. Stuff that Alfonso was, he said at one point, he goes, this is amazing. Everything that you can hear is something that I wrote and means something to me. <laughs> so where are you gonna go actually, you know? Right, yeah. Your playbook does not extend to anywhere near that on your average movie, even more complicated movies. Um, so the, Craig and I just realized the thing to do is just like, let it go and just let him guide us and let him do what he asks, basically. Right. So the, the, the kind of <clears throat> immersion and panning and, and, and moving stuff around really wouldn't have been possible before Dolby Atmos. 
and I just you know I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about using Atmos in, in the film. Was that always part of the of the conversation between you and Alfonso from the beginning? Was that that was part of what you you guys knew that you were going to do? I would say uh, gravity being a stepping off point. Would so when we first made gravity, um, the first mix was a seven one mix, and we were setting it up so we could then do an Atmos mix uh, about six months later when the tools were available. At that point, there wasn't a panner. There was there was only these, a physical uh, device, which was really hard to use. So uh, by the summer of 2013, we had a plug-in to use in our mixing environment in Pro Tools so we could do easily do the, the Atmos uh, remix. And I mean, I, I think if you ask him, he would say that that was a stepping off point and that he, what we learned on gravity, we then applied to this more uh, kind of, I hate to use the word precise, but more intricate version of a, a film track, soundtrack. Yeah. And by the way, we were all loving um, Atmos <laughs> and the uh, vision situation, no doubt about it. Yeah, it's pretty stunning. I mean, one of the things that I really responded to is, is I think a lot of people you know, when they think about Dolby Atmos, they think about gravity or crazy, you know, science fiction movies or animated films. But um, to me, just the way you were able to use the technology to evoke Mexico City and make it so specific and really put the audience right in there was was really powerful. Do you want to comment on that or just take the compliment? Thank you. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I've been to Mexico City, but I don't know it anywhere near near that. Well, we were completely relying on Alfonso and uh, Sergio to deliver the goods there. We and again we sort of did what we were told. Craig, Craig, I don't know if Craig's been to Mexico City or not, but uh, Craig, he's from Canada for Christ's sake. Right. I don't know. <laughs> so did anybody make a recording trip to go down there, or how did you guys gather your sound effects? Or have, what, tell us a little bit about that process. Well, Sergio lives in Mexico City, and he's a supervising sound editor, and he gathered all that material and recorded tons of stuff. We had a lot of great recordings as well as uh, recordings from Wild Trek from the, during the production. Jose, I think Jose had a crew working with him he could send off to do recordings. And um, we, we didn't have that many vehicles to worry about, but we actually did the vehicles later. Uh, my buddies at Warner Brothers in L.A. Did, uh, gave us recordings for the vehicles. But, um, you know, it's strangely mostly about talking, the movie. The sound of the movie is mostly talking in airplanes flying overhead. So that, <laughs> where they, where Alfonso and Chivo grew up was in the flight path. And so he said the planes, even then in 70, 71, landed every two or three minutes. So it was just like a constant flow. And we tried to stick with it for a while and it was just, it was such an unimportant detail. But whenever we had the time to throw one in, we could, we could superimpose it. Um, let's open up and take some questions from the audience. Uh, you guys are filmmakers. I'm sure you have some fantastic questions for Skip. Uh, I'm going to cover my eyes so I can see. Can't see that way. Any hands? Yes, right here. Um, I was wondering when you're creating this sort of sonic space of the film, the, to what extent were you trying to remain faithful to the actual depth and distance between the camera and what we're hearing uh, versus playing with that distance, manipulating it to, you know, impact our emotional experience? Um, I think you probably know that this is a, a problem with all movies. Um, when you have a close-up, it's much drier. When you have a wide shot, it's more reverberant, particularly in a reverberant space like a room, you know, or a hallway or something. And that's something that's always that exists in every film. And generally, unless you're trying to use that, like you could say the close-ups in the close-ups, you can you can hear them, <laughs> and then in the wide shot, maybe you can't hear them because it's too far away. But beyond that idea, you're almost always trying to make everything sound kind of from the same place. This weird kind of um, movable uh, point of view, audio-wise, and so you might have you might add some reverb to the close-up sounds to make it sound like it's more there. But almost always, you're kind of following the the, the cinema of it, you know, the wide shots, you need to hear what they're saying, but they, they want to sound a little wider. The close-ups, you want it to be intimate, but you still want it to feel like it's in the same space. So in this film, um, everything is being tested that way, because almost everything we had 
some room mics and we had some lavs and the room mics are very wide and echoey and ambient sounding and the lavs are very dry and very close up and bassy sounding like from your chest you know so you're you're constantly playing that game and it's helped because we don't have wides and close-ups we don't we have one shot so you set up a sound kind of tableau for each shot and then just try to stick to it and then you're just varying the textures based on if you want it to be more intimate there's less reverb if, if you want it to be roomy like some event is happening that can be more reverberant but um, it's a little bit like um, putting the right amount of uh, paste in the, in the paint <laughs> to make it you know textural or smooth or sand coated etc it's it's really it's a pretty simple tool it's it's not easy to do all the time and of course the recordings have a mixture of reverberate reverberation or not some stuff sounds really wide and and inappropriately wide but um, this is just like a mechanical issue beyond a certain point now philosophically and from the filmmaker's point of view you know you can spend a lot of time dicing that up and, and you can superimpose these distances by changing the amount of intimacy of their sounds in the recording but um, this movie was much more of a like I say it really to me always felt like an observational documentary and we we're just trying to heighten the reality and still make the words um, land with the audience how much uh, principal uh, ADR with the principals was there? Hmm. I would say throughout the whole film there might be, let's say, 20% uh, ADR for the principal characters and uh, an unbelievable, an astronomical amount of group um, recordings, um, like the, the delivery scene, which is so amazing. That had, um, there were four groups that were on camera and we had recordings for the doctor, the patient and the technician for each one of those groups and some of them were done individually and discreetly and some of them were done as a group but we still had recordings for each group that you see on screen and then we have our foreground people and the foreground people was a combination of production sound and some ADR as well and um, we <laughs> so we had to maintain uh, a, a credible relation, a credible amount of talking and off-camera sounds from them without interfering with, with what was happening off-camera. And that, that's, I don't know how long we spent on those scene. Uh, those two scenes in the delivery room was just very demanding. I presume. Uh, there are other questions from the audience. Right here. Um, the beach sequence with the near drowning was really arresting. Can you talk about the thought process behind the sound design of that and then the elements that went into it? That sequence was is mostly ADR. There is a fair amount of production sound, but um, it's generally ADR. And we had to, we just wanted to get the, uh, well, we wanted the actors to feel like they were in that location. So you, loud enough to know what was going on and get what was happening, but not so loud as we weren't telling a story there, basically. It was much more visually and sound-wise. Uh, Alfonso, I think Alfonso had, that's part of his memory relationship, was the really loud sound of the surf and the, the um, power of the surf. Uh, he wanted it to be uh, a little more than what you were literally seeing and he wanted to really make the audience feel the, the threat. And, you know, it doesn't take much to get into big trouble in the ocean, so unless you're a really great swimmer. But um, I, I think that was the idea, was that... Um, the sound would push the audience into a more threatening environment. Well, She's asking you for, what's the secret sauce the of that secret? sequence? <laughs> well, you would have to really speak to Craig and uh, Sergio. I, most of what's in there is surf and surf sounds, and some from Mexico and some from Los Angeles and some from libraries and recordings that Craig and Sergio had made over the years. And um, there's some mechanical stuff like um, when the, when the waves, and eventually when we get into the ocean, there's a lot of sub information to really amp up the, uh, the kind of um, the sensation of being hopelessly being pulled out to sea. And, you know, the idea that what, what, the, what we have on the beach is the tiniest, tiniest portion of what's on the other side of the 
going out that way. Mm -hmm. nice. <laughs> so um, I guess you could probably have unlimited power if you if you really tried to show what was what was just lapping on the beach is just the tiniest fingertip of this huge thing. So I think that was the general idea. I, it kind of went down and it took several days to nail that down, but it sort of went down in a kind of Craig knows what to do. He's worked on many big films um, and he's a talented, very talented um, sound effects mixer as well. So we had the same basic path in every scene you know what to do, okay, do that. And then we would present it and then Alfonso would work through it with us. And that seems no uh, exception. We worked in the same way. And it's really just layers and layers and layers. The, the idea was to try to make sounds for everything that you saw. So when you would see, in, even on the far side, you'd see a little something, little wave curl over maybe 50 yards away. We still tried to make sounds for everything, every little swirl that you could see. And you know some of that is done um, with digital effects. Um, the, the, they were in the water, but they weren't in quite as much danger as you might imagine. And even though they weren't actors and represented by a SAG, <laughs> they, they, um, it was amped up a bit in CG. Although it's, I mean, it's pretty much. It wasn't. It's not like totally different compared to what the raw dailies look like. Does that do it? Um, I did want to ask you about how involved Alfonso is at the mix, because um, I, I, I know we've certainly, I mean, you know, there, there's extremes, you know, I, you know, I've, I've certainly in the past worked with somebody like Clint Eastwood who, you know, will let the team go for several days and then show up to play back a few reels at a time and give some notes and then disappear mm. for a week and then come back. But then I've also worked with, and I know you've worked with Darren Aronofsky, and when I worked with Darren, we couldn't pre-mix fully without him being on the stage. So where does Alfonso kind of fit in that in that continuum? He's definitely on the far right of uh, aggravatingly always there. <laughs> no doubt about it. Or you could say far left, depends on your point of view. But he's um, he is, thank God, the world's greatest authority on what's happening in his movie. And there's no easier way to get at the issues than to have him come in and he, of course, puts his finger on the biggest problems right away. Uh, I'm always a big believer in addressing the biggest problems at the beginning, so because then it just gets so much easier and it's more fun. The um, We work in a very virtual way, so everything is playing, nothing is married or attached, and everything can be removed or changed. And um, that is a big benefit, and nothing is ever recorded until the very end. Really, the, the final product is recorded, and that's it. And um, we have um, this Pro Tools system that we work in is, is so flexible that we can, uh, with enough time and energy, you can change you know every sound ad nauseum, which we, did, we tried to do, basically, in this mix. <laughs> and um, he, he, has, um, he has very good taste, and he's very knowledgeable about sound and how it works in films. Um, but he's also, um, well, he, artistically, he's, he has worked as an editor. He worked as an editor on this film. And he knows what the editorial process is as well as anyone I've ever known. And he, he, does, he does like to participate. He really enjoys the sound process in the way that the Coen brothers enjoy it and uh, Darren Aronofsky enjoys it. He is not like Clint Eastwood where... Um, <laughs> I know from my friends who work with Clint Eastwood, and he apparently is, if you hit stop, he, he will say, to go back and change something, he'll, he has been known to say, who told you to stop? And so then if anyone says, well, we need to go back and raise the music, I can't hear that word, whatever it is, he has been known to say, let's not overthink this, guys. <laughs> Alfonso is, is on the total opposite end. So Clint would be on one side and Alfonso would be completely in the other room uh, compared to that notion of how to do the sound. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. In terms of films that are these more kind of, although this is an epic, uh, intimate dramas that live in that kind of like intimate drama space as opposed to a giant action film, who were some of your influences, inspirations um, that you look to? 
Uh, so the question was about your influence and inspiration, especially when thinking about um, sort of more emotional uh, dramas as opposed to maybe bigger action films. I did, I'm, I'm going to steal the microphone and point out that you are now the inspiration for many people coming up who look to your work with the Coen brothers, uh, uh, you know, as inspiration for, for their work. But let's hear your answer to the question. I don't um, know quite how to answer. I think I, I've always looked at the job as a job. Like, um, and I've always thought, I, I mean, I, at one point I was going to go to school to study to be an architect. And I, I think that um, a film is like a house. And I think that the craftsmanship involved is, is similar um, in the number of people involved and the number of details and how they can be expressed. And I've always thought of the, the job as, as a way of um, helping the architect realize his dream, basically. And uh, being in New York, you, you don't really get to work on very many like Star Wars type movies. It's just not a problem. <laughs> you don't have to worry about getting distracted by shiny objects. There just, there aren't that many. And I've worked on a few, like Men in Black, for instance, was done here in New York, but um, there, there not, aren't very many distractions. I mean, almost everything is, is about uh, the story, the performance, um, the filmmaking, and the style of the filmmakers. And it, it is challenging sometimes to, to see what you're doing. I, I worked on a project recently. Um, I think I can tell you this. <laughs> without fear of reprisal. Uh, it's mid-90s, uh, the Jonah Hill film. Mm. And um, I hired my friend Aaron Glasscock, who grew up in the 90s in California and was a skater. And he, he, I thought you couldn't have made a more perfect assignment for it, my friend Aaron. And we went about the movie and did it in the way that we thought was normal and necessary. And we played back a couple of reels for Jonah and he was horrified. <laughs> we had completely gotten it wrong and Aaron and I were like flabbergasted. We didn't even do that much. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like Men in Black. I mean, it was, it was a drama. And so we had supplied sound effects and backgrounds and Foley and stuff and we'd mixed the movie like movies we thought were supposed to sound. And they said, no. And Scott Rudin, the producer, said, my God, what have you done? <laughs> and you've done many movies with Scott. And I've worked with Scott a lot. And I'm like, I, um, I don't know. <laughs> so I said, OK, well, let's, let's go back to the beginning. Do you, do, you just want, do you just want it to sound like the Avid tracks? I mean, your cutting tracks? Well, yeah. So, OK. So we took everything away, and we just took the tracks that they gave us. You all know what Avid tracks are. They're the tracks that you're cutting as you're going. So you, as you're editing the picture, you have the sync sound that goes with it, and nothing more added, except for music, and this is a music film to a degree. So we made a mix of that without changing very much. And they, they came back the next day or a day later, and they said, yeah, OK, yeah, that's it, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, great. I've been working in this business for 40 years. I mean, I've never been asked to do it quite, quite like that. And the, the one thing that was um, comforting about that is that we were just doing what we thought was right. And we weren't um, terribly invested in our ideas or our concepts. And it was easy to just go, OK, Sorry, didn't know. And so I think that's the short, it's a very long way of saying being doing, doing what you're told. And of course you learn as you go and you learn from the movies that you work on. Like with the Coens, for instance, or with Scorsese, we have a kind of, uh, over the years, we have developed a sort of a shorthand and we refer to the other films like in that, do it like the way we did in Lebowski, et cetera. But much beyond that, you're really just trying to uh, take, like they say, take away the things that don't sound like a movie and make the things that sound like a movie louder. 
basically. <laughs> Is that, that, I'm not trying to be cute. I mean, I'm really serious. Like, I feel like, you know, of course, your taste and your judgment is what makes that work. But I think it's the simple lesson that I've learned over the years. Okay, I saw you, sir, right here in the middle had a question, if we can do it quickly before, and then get out. Yeah. Um, like, couldn't that have been avoided if you had had a conversation earlier in the process with Jonah? And that, my original question was, how come sound designers aren't involved in the pre-production like a DP is? I'm glad you asked that, especially with this group of filmmakers, which is, how, how do you navigate discord and artistic disagreement between the two of you and and how best to communicate with each other at the beginning of the process so hopefully that's minimized well of course we had an extensive um, spotting session with jonah and the editor and he was super enthusiastic about the sound design that we were going to do for the movie <laughs> i took copious notes it took the better part of a day we went through the whole film as i do on every film Except with, well, even with Joel and Ethan, we spend a fair amount of time talking about what stuff is not clear, not obvious. So I did a movie, um, the um, Miles Davis movie that was directed by Don Cheadle and starring Don Cheadle called Miles Ahead. And we had a similar breakdown with his editor. We went through the whole movie scene by scene. We talked about sound design this and sound design that. I keep, sound design is, is, the, is like the bane of this particular question. So we made some sounds at the beginning of Miles Ahead, which is pretty abstract film uh, in some ways. He had, we talked about sound design and, and there's a there's kind of a montage sequence at the beginning of the film where we have music and there's a chase scene and how does this relate and I did a lot of homework on the film and I knew basically the real story for pretty much everything that was in the film. And um, Miles is at home in his townhouse listening to these tapes and the tapes, um, the one particular tape that they were, that the movie is essentially about was a recording that Larry Coriol's wife organized and Larry played on with Miles and Miles' uh, nephew Vincent and um, um, a couple of other players I can't recall at the moment, but they, um, nothing good came out of that recording. and. Miles is listening in the movie, he's supposed to be listening to that tape. And what you're seeing, the montage you're seeing, is about what's happening with that tape. And so we kept, there's a lot of changing and stuff happening and it's kind of supposed to be kind of um, abstract. And Don and the editor encouraged us to do a lot of radical sounds there. And so we made a lot of radical sounds using tape recorders and a bunch of kind of of the period sort of types of sound manipulation and um, one day I said okay can I show you guys the sequence I want to make sure that we're doing the right thing here so Don and the editor came and sat in my little sound design room and I played back the sequence and um, they were very quiet <laughs> they were sitting behind me and I went oh boy this is one of those times so I Turned and I looked at Don, and Don was like this. I said, that, that we got a problem there, Don. He said, <laughs> yeah, wh what is all this stuff? I mean, it's all lovely and interesting, and I think I know how you, where, where you're coming from, but like, what, what are we doing? And I said, well, Don, um, to me, sound design means X, and to you, clearly, sound design means something else. So all those layers, when the many times that he had said sound design, how the editor had said sound design, they were talking about footsteps. An effect. Or a door close, or like a room tone. To, to them, sound design means one thing. <laughs> and really, in my world, sound design means something pretty radically different than that. I mean, for my definition, sound design is stuff that you can't record. Stuff that you have to make, stuff that you have to create. You gotta take some recording sound something from somewhere and paste it together and make something that can a filmmaker can grab onto and approve and wanna put in the movie. I mean, it's some really serious goopus. <laughs> And 
That's what happened on the Miles movie, and that's what happened on the Jonah Hill movie. I mean, the Jonah Hill movie was much more straightforward. We had put in sound effects and normal sounds, and we used the sounds that they gave us, but we changed the mix. And for, for Jonah, being a young filmmaker, uh, the mix was really the sound design to him. And the, the times that he said sound is designed to me, he was talking about the music. He was talking about the volume of the music in the film. And the music that's in the film is all songs. There's a little bit of score by Trent and Atticus, but most of the music is songs. Not playing from, not diegetic. I mean, songs that are layered. They're playing a score. Yeah. And that was really... That, that was about as out there as I've, uh, about as nakedly not doing my job as I've ever experienced. <laughs> I mean, we were really wrong. And luckily it was easy to fix. And, and then uh, through, over, we did that version, the totally uh, avid track, the, the, the like no sound design by any of my people version. <laughs> and then we played that back and they were like, Okay, I get it. So wait, can we change this? And we proceeded to put some things back and we changed we made the mix which exists now. And it's there's some radical things in that which we which we all agreed made the movie better, but uh most of that's most of the sound effects that we the skateboard sounds and the atmospheres and stuff were taken out. And it's it's a pretty much production track and music uh driven film. And that's what worked for them. That's one of the funly challenging parts of my job is you just don't know what's coming. Like this movie, for instance. I never, you know, even after Gravity, I wouldn't know where we're going to go next. And here we ended up in a totally, orbiting another totally different planet. Yeah. I, I have to admit it is oddly reassuring to me that you can still have these experiences where there's such a disconnect, even at this point in your <laughs> illustrious career. Um, I, I will say that, you know, in my own experience of listening to Skip's tracks, one of the things that has always stood out for me about your work <clears throat> is, uh, you know, it was in listening to your tracks that I really kind of started to understand that that sound design wasn't just about having a lot of sound in the film. That I think the thing that really uh, is remarkably consistent about your work is that is that the sounds are very specific and I would say perfectly placed. I can still, you know, I can still hear the sound of that air gun from No Country for Old Men <laughs> in my head uh, without even really any effort to conjure it up. So I think that's part of that's one of the things that you do incredibly well. Uh, and I'm I'm just uh, I'm thrilled that you were able to come and spend some time with us uh, here today and talk about Roma and about the, the the sound work in this amazing film. Thanks everybody for coming out for the program. So that's our conversation on Roma. Thanks again for uh, tuning in. This is Glenn Kaiser signing off from the Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection.